Welcome to the webinar. Um, we are going to be discussing um, what happens when your metadata leaves the house, basically. Um, and we'll break this down into a couple of areas. Um, we're going to talk about e-commerce, of course, but we're also going to talk about library because that's increasingly important as well. So just to get us started, um, we'll begin with e-commerce. Uh, because that's where most of the eyeballs on your metadata actually are. So, basically, we're going to look at metadata as a functional map. Um, metadata gets assigned to different projects at different points in the publishing process. So basically, um, at the acquisition stage, that's when you assign ISBNs to tradable products. You assign your title, your author, and your price at that point. Um, they may change along the way, but that's where the initial metadata happens. Then in editorial, um, that's where the buy categories get assigned, um, and initial product descriptions are created. Um, then at the handoff to production and design, the cover image gets created, and that's when um, you begin to know what the page count of the book is going to be and what publishing um, format types you're going to put the book out in, paperback, ebook, what have you. Um, and at the marketing stage, you're creating market-specific product descriptions, um, advanced aggregate, um, you're going to aggregate advanced reviews, and you're going to confirm the pub date. Now, this is kind of an ideal picture, and we'll get into some of the variations on this. Um, but ideally, this is all feeding into a central metadata repository where um, you've got uh, everything available for everyone else to look at, although you're going to have different permissions on different fields, so you, you don't get rogues changing things. So Onyx stands for Online Information Exchange. It's an XML format. Um, it's a series of tags with specialized codes. It's a communication tool. You don't store data in Onyx. You send and receive data in Onyx. It was developed in the late 1990s and is sort of shorthand for book metadata. But Onyx isn't just the XML tags. It's code lists as well fixed lists of values that you might think of as drop-downs if you're looking at it through um, a graphical user interface. And those values are used in other formats than XML. You can apply these values in an ASCII file, in an Excel file, um, and that's how smaller publishers tend to use Onyx. In the US, we're still using version 2.1. Version 3 is ready to implement, and it is, um, 2.1 is not supported by the governing body of Onyx uh, anymore. Um, organizations, many of them are ready to receive it or send it, but no one's made the first move to actually do so yet. And as with so much in book publishing, Onyx 2.1 is quote unquote good enough, and the pain of moving to a new version seems to be greater than the pain of staying put. So this is an Onyx file in the wild. I don't know why my mouse is doing that. Um, Onyx tags are human readable in long form. There are, however, abbreviations to the tags, which are easier for computers to process. Onyx consists of composites, which are groupings of metadata. So in this example, the supply detail composite includes things like who's supplying the ebook, how to contact them, what rights they have to sell the book, the availability status, the pricing information, and discounting information. Within the composites are frequently codes. So you see the product availability code is a number. That number corresponds to a particular status. And these codes are outlined in the code list that get added to or deprecated from by the various Onyx metadata uh, maintenance committees around the world. So the governing body of Onyx is editor in the UK. In the US, the code lists are maintained by the BISG metadata committee, which then works with editor at the international level. So, sound complicated? It can be. 
from the first day we, we began creating Onyx code lists in 1999, there were terms no one could agree on. Page count, for example, the physical count of the pages in a book or the number of pages in a book. What about forwards? What about indices? What about appendixes? Do those count too? And to this day, as an industry, we have never been able to successfully define a page count, which is why um, it is a mess in most databases. It is a, a, a free text field where people enter whatever they want. PubDate is another example of a, a sort of problematic uh, metadata field. Is it the date that the book hits the stores? Is it the date the book can be made available if a store chooses to? Is it the date the book is scheduled to be manufactured? And what if it's actually a date range? So discussions like these are what it's like to sit on an Onyx metadata committee. You don't have to use Onyx per se, as I was saying. Smaller publishers tend to use Excel templates um, supplied by their trading partners to communicate the same information, um, the information in the code list. The larger publishers use the XML format to communicate with. So everyone's passing around the same type of data, just in different formats. Formats are important, but they're just the envelope. The codes are the information inside the envelope, your actual message. So there are really two factors you have to pay attention to. The format, if you're using XML, the file has to validate the way any XML file needs to, or your trading partner can't process it, and then the content. So what happens when it leaves the house? Well, we'll find out as soon as the slide advances. OK, there we go. The data gets absorbed by the various trading partners on whatever schedule they've decided to adhere to. And then other stuff happens to it. Proprietary data gets added. Not all the data you send gets used. Data points get mapped, as we discussed um, it, as we have previously discussed in other se excuse me, sessions. So what appears on any given screen will differ somewhat from what you sent out. And that can be frustrating. There are so many different players in the metadata arena that can affect what a book record looks like. When you send your information to Bowker, they add proprietary categories. They massage author and series names. They add their own descriptions, and they append reviews from sources that they license. And they send that information out to retailers and libraries. And the same thing ha happens at Ingram, at Baker and Taylor. So what appears on a book product page on, for example, Amazon, is a mishmash of data from a wide variety of sources, not just you. And that's why we have to get into the idea of ranking. At an online retailer, different data sources get ranked differently. This happens over time as a result of relationships and familiarity with data quality. And these rankings can change. The data can also get ranked on a field-by-field -field basis. So a publisher might be the best source of data for title, author, categories, and cover image. But the distributor might be ranked higher for things like price and availability. And an aggregator might be ranked higher for things like series names, especially if they specify to the retailer that that's something they're focusing on standardizing and cleaning up. It's important to remember that in the eyes of the retailer, not all data feeds are equal. You would think the publisher would be the best source of data about it, its own book, but I can assure you, having worked with publisher data my entire 30-year career, that is not always the case. For a publishing house, updating old metadata records is a break from normal workflow. So it doesn't happen as often as it should for optimal marketing purposes. It's important to remember, though, that the job doesn't stop once the book leaves the house. There are reviews and awards and other events that are worth making stores and readers aware of through your metadata feed. Just another quick word on terminology when it comes to updates. A delta file is what we call these updates, additions, changes, and deletes only, rather than a full file. Most publishers will send an initial full file and then supplement with delta files for a time and begin the cycle again just to make sure their trading partners are in sync. However, on the retailer aggregator end, 
there's no guarantee that your updates are going to get processed in a timely way, at least not without a phone call. The Borg assimilate on their own schedule. And if they have a very heavy processing week, they might skip your Delta file and wait for the next one, which means there might be gaps in data updates. And this is why publishers find themselves occasionally sending out a full file, just to be sure all the records are brought up to date. I want to get into library data as well, because while it's not as sexy as retail, libraries do form a critical market that we often don't pay so much attention to. Most publishers, unless libraries make up a significant portion of their customers, don't create their own MARC records. Baker and Taylor does a huge business creating MARC records for libraries, as does OCLC, who has member librarians catalog millions of items for WorldCat database, in addition to the actual literal warehouse of catalogers whom I've met um, that they have on staff. Truly, it is a warehouse. I've been there. And the library customers themselves. So MARC stands for Machine Readable Catalog Record. It was developed in the 1960s by Harriet Avram at the Library of Congress as they began using computers with punch cards to store and transmit information about their holdings. As you can see from the sample, MARC is not exactly intuitive or human readable. The fields are numbered, and catalogers eventually they get to memorize which numbers correspond with what should go in those fields. MARC is also not simply descriptive metadata for the purpose of marketing a book to a patron. It's also an inventory system. The intent behind MARC is different from that behind Onyx. Also, unlike Onyx, MARC is not book specific. Libraries catalog a wide array of materials in addition to in addition to books, they catalog films, software, music, websites, streaming content, physical objects like ebook readers and laptops, maps, musical scores, periodicals, and individual articles. Some libraries use their cataloging system for booking conference rooms and creating events. MARC has been revised and expanded. There's MARC 21, there's MARC XML but it's never been satisfactorily replaced. Global libraries infrastructure depends on it, and as with Onyx 3, the pain of transitioning to something new outweighs any constraints caused by a format based on 1960s computing standards. You may in your travels have heard of something called FERBER. It stands for Functional Requirements for Bibliographic Records and was developed by a global library federation in the early 2000s. FERBER is a way of thinking about resources in a library in a very hierarchical way. In the book world, a work would be something like the idea for Alice in Wonderland, realized through the expression of that in the manuscript original file, as well as the Disney movie, as well as the Tim Burton movie which would then be embodied in various manifestations or edition, annotated, board book, streaming, DVD, et cetera. This, the item is the actual thing that a user accesses, the, the copy that you hold in your hand or the file that you're streaming. So to think about it in book terms, the ISBN gets assigned to the manifestation, and the item level is all the copies of that ISBN. It's not perfect, and of course the jury is always out on what a work really is, which is why it so frequently falls apart upon close examination in the world of trade. Given Mark's age, it's no surprise that the library community has been fishing around for more updated alternatives. BibFrame, or Bibliographic Framework, is the newish effort to come up with a way to describe resources using linked data principles. And it's helpful to note that in library land, the term bibliographic refers not just to books, but all resources that might reside in or pass through a library and need to be fully implemented. Library of Congress has just released version 2.0, but it has yet to be fully implemented. Currently, 13 library systems globally are experimenting with it. You'll notice some similarities to Ferber, and again, there are arguments as to how to define work 
but at least it's implementable. Okay, we're going to change the slide again, um, but it's not, there we go, okay. So basically the answer to everything is twofold. The book industry is not monolithic. It has pockets of quirk, it has changing rules, and it has polar opposite expectations from competing vendors. Which means, of course, you have to pick up the phone or email or whatever. Find out what your trading partners want from you, one by one. Do your best to provide that to them. There's no one size fits all in this business, but it's a lot easier to manage that with digital communications than it used to be with paper catalogs and typewritten letters. Onyx was built to enhance communication, but it's not a perfect tool, nor are any of the others that we've covered here. There's a lot of interstitial juggling and patchwork that we have to do in addition to standardized communication. These are some resources I've posted um, just to help you get your mind around different, um, different uh, ways of thinking about metadata. One is the um, BISG's development, use, and modification of book metadata. It was written um, back in 2012, but our industry really does not change that much. So um, every word of it is still valid. And then um, BISG's best practices for product metadata um, is free. So those are um, resources that you can consult to um, uh, give you some guidance about metadata and why things are the way they are in the book industry. So thank you very much for listening to this. Um, I appreciate your patience with the technology. Uh, if you have questions, please feel free to email me, ljndawson at gmail.com, and I'd be happy to get back to you.